Well, July is about running out here, and we're starting to really watch the tropics closely. Not much going on, and any delay in the season is certainly welcome news after a string of rough hurricane disasters. We'll hope for a quiet year, but if not, check back in, and we'll pull up those charts and see what's going on. Yeah, so that's the view in the Atlantic right now. Let's go back one year ago. Yeah, this was July 29th of 2024. That looks like trouble. That was Hurricane Debbie, Category 1, making landfall up there in northern Florida around August 5th. And as that moved up into Canada, it produced devastating floods, billions of dollars worth of damage. Out in the Pacific Ocean, a different story. Hurricane Iona, a high-end Category 3 storm, 500 miles south of Hawaii. That intensified rapidly. However, it is moving westward. There's nothing out there, and it's of no concern to anybody. Tropical Storm Kelly close by, a much weaker storm. That'll also move south of Hawaii. This thing may come together. That's kind of an impressive little wrap-up right there but it is not a named storm. And we're looking for development out there off of Mexico. This is not expected to affect the uh, west coast there. There's a closer look at our storms. There's Iona, there's Kelly, and there's this other one that may start coming together. Little feature off the uh, big island. This just caught my attention. Let me zoom in on that. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is. Maybe some sort of convergence line, the Flow looks kind of complex through there. Looks like a vortex right there and some channeled flow through that gap between those two islands. Anyway, a lot to see out there in Hawaii this time of year. And uh, I do remember a couple years ago, we had those wildfires out there. That was back in 2023, August 8th through 16th. So it was at this time of year. And it's easy to see why those wildfires can be a problem with these strengthened trade winds. Checking out our weather picture in the lower 48, rather quiet. The Bermuda High is weak. Also weak pressure gradients throughout the southeastern and central U.S. We do have some cold air flowing in from Canada that will gradually sink southward during the week. The monsoon is active out there in New Mexico, at least for the next few days. And that is pretty much about it. Some severe weather in parts of the central plains and the dry line active in western Kansas. The big story, however, is the heat. This is a new chart that you're going to be seeing more of. I'm still in the process of generating it, so just ignore the uh, data down here. It's a little bit wonky, but this is for today. This is this afternoon. We're looking for highs in the 100s from Shreveport to Wichita Falls and up to Salina. These are official forecast highs by a human forecaster. This is not model data. So we're seeing those 110s in the southwestern deserts, that hot weather in the central U.S., and this, a corridor of very hot weather from Boston to Philadelphia, approaching 100, and this is with humidity as well. And in Florida, 100 degrees at Jacksonville and Gainesville, and a lot of hot weather in the northwestern U.S. as well. 83 at Seattle, with 92 at Portland and Salem. So a lot of the country really getting that heat, but up north, this is the Canadian air coming southward. Highs in the 70s and low 80s. The northeast, the famous region where folks go to cool off in the summer, home of the Borscht Belt and summer cottages in Maine. They're having their own weather problems today with summer. Temperatures well into the 90s across a wide swath in that region. There's the current temperatures as we record this. 96 at Boston, starting to cool off, and they did reach 98 for today. 80s up there in upstate New York, 94 around Poughkeepsie, and 90s all through Pennsylvania. A little bit of relief down to the south where we've got showers and storms around the Shenandoahs. And I'll just show you the layout of all the advisories and warnings. This is a big heat advisory for the Northeast Corridor, expecting heat indexes up to 103. Extreme heat warning in northeastern New Jersey, heat index up to 105. 
more of the same as we go west. We pick up extreme heat warnings around Huntington and Charleston and a big one from St. Louis to Paducah out to Louisville. Not sure if that's quite all the way to Louisville, maybe just west of there, down to Nashville and down to Cape Girardeau and Memphis. Heat indexes there could be up to 115. So do what you can to stay cool and make sure you check on those elderly people. They really suffer in this kind of weather. Same story in the southeast. We mentioned those hundreds around Jacksonville. We pick up the extreme heat warnings in the lower Mississippi River Plains all the way down to Jacksonville and Natchez. And as you can see, heat advisories just about everywhere except the Blue Ridge Mountains, parts of the Carolinas and southern Florida. The satellite imagery shows numerous showers and storms all the way from Hot Springs, Little Rock, all across the Deep South to Jacksonville, Columbia, Charleston, and Wilmington. Across the Southern Plains, well, it's quiet, but misery loves company, and we've got the heat going on there as well. We are seeing 100 degree temperatures today from Fort Worth to Oklahoma City and into central Kansas. However, most of our heat advisories are found in southern Louisiana, the Beaumont Port Arthur area, other heat advisories from Dallas to Oklahoma City, and Fort Smith. Heat index is there today and Wednesday could be up to 109. Further up north, all of the lower plains are under heat advisories, eastern Kansas, southeastern Nebraska, all of Missouri, and southern Iowa. So something like that right there. Extreme heat warning in the Omaha-Lincoln area for heat index is up to 114, probably in part due to those heavily irrigated crop fields that puts out substantial moisture and raises those dew points. Cooler air lurks to the north, however. You can see some of it coming south right there. Thunderstorms in between. A repeat of yesterday with severe weather in South Dakota. A slight risk covers this area, this storm a little bit further north. However, yesterday we had a moderate risk all across this area. There's a look at the radar out of Sioux Falls. This is similar to yesterday, but more of a MCS, less in the way of discrete tornadic supercells. And we did have a few of those down in this area. But they're getting it once again. The main hazards, however, confined to wind damage and isolated occurrences of large hail. Further down the line, convection all the way through the North Platte area, down into the Imperial and McCook area. However, I don't see any strongly organized convection at this time. Looks a little bit disorganized and maybe even outflowish. There's some outflow bubbles all through here. And out in Colorado, a broken mass of showers and storms from Lamar over to Pueblo and up towards the Denver International Airport. And in the southwestern U.S., the monsoon is active in New Mexico, Colorado, the Four Corners. We have a flood watch in effect for central and southern New Mexico for today. That uh, is going to be for locally heavy rainfall. The lower deserts of Arizona, they are topping out at 110 to 111 today, 104 for Tucson. And further up north, the Dragon Bravo fire continues burning on the Grand Canyon north rim. And also the Monroe Canyon fire south of Richfield, that's showing up as well. These areas under red flag warnings, and we've got other fire advisories and warnings further out west in Oregon, in California. In the northwestern U.S., continued hot, looking at 83 at Seattle, 90s across the rest of the northwest, and we've got showers and storms out there, which is bringing the potential for lightning-induced wildfires, and any wildfires that get going could be kicked up by gusty outflow winds as well. There is a marginal risk for severe in southeastern Oregon for this afternoon and evening. And we head out into the North Pacific, and there is a wound up low pressure area. It's been out there for the past couple of days, and this is a barotropic system. The thickness indicated by the red dashed lines pretty much nested within that isobar pattern. So that's an indicator of very little temperature advection. So this will continue weakening over the next couple of days. Further out into the Pacific, way up there off of Kamchatka, 
there has been a magnitude 8 earthquake that was at uh, 7.24 p.m. Eastern Time, 130 kilometers offshore from Kamchatka. So there is a tsunami threat. I'm not sure if we're getting any information out of there. Yeah, and that's it right there. Very populated area of Petropavlovsk. I don't think it is exposed right there on the coast. This is the layout of Petropavlovsk, so any incoming tsunami would affect mostly this area. A little more complex getting into the bay right here. Uh, certainly the effects would be a little bit more limited as the wave would disperse all through here. This tidal plane, that would be vulnerable for sure. But a lot of the city is up on higher ground, so there is at least that. It's not the flat plane that we had in Japan during the 2011 event. So there may not even be a tsunami wave. There's no way to really tell with the limited data that we have, but certainly there is a risk with a earthquake this strong. And looking at the rest of the region, Alaska under a west-northwest flow pattern, which tends to be on the cool side. Some warm weather across Yukon and southern Alaska. Anchorage appears to be up to 70 this afternoon. Further south in British Columbia, we have heat warnings all through the interior from Prince George all the way down to the U.S. border. Temperatures could be in the mid-90s over the next couple of days with up to 100 around Kelowna. In the prairies, wildfire smoke warnings continue from Saskatchewan into Ontario. Heat warnings continue for the populated southern districts, Windsor to Ottawa, not quite into Quebec there. But in the Maritimes, we do have heat warnings for Nova Scotia, southern New Brunswick. There could be upper 80s today and tomorrow. I'm going to go ahead and give you the forecast now because we've somehow gotten way behind schedule. This uh, frontal system will continue pushing south through the Midwest, producing numerous rounds of showers and storms through the Corn Belt. And that'll help reinforce the cold front to a certain extent. The uh, colder Canadian air will not work very far south. Most of that will remain around the Ohio River, Missouri, and Kansas. The boundary itself, however, will reach parts of the Deep South and the Red River region and North Texas, the West Texas region, and gradually it will dissipate. So here we are up to the weekend. Saturday, high pressure across the Great Lakes into the northeastern U.S., so some relief from that heat wave. Northerly flow elsewhere that will bring drier air southward. And as we go into the remainder of the weekend and into early next week, maybe a couple of northwest flow type situations Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, that does tend to happen this time of year when these boundaries get hung up like that. So that'll probably be the story for the start of next week. A couple rounds of showers working down that boundary, maybe nocturnal thunderstorms, that kind of thing. And then the very end of the period, late next week, you can see that not really a whole lot has happened over the past week, just that cold air gradually sagging south and storms forming wherever those boundaries are. This could be a development zone right here, this Bear Clinic region. So we'll have to watch for the development of a possible weather system in the northwestern U.S., but I would not expect very much strength out of that this time of year. That's all for this edition of Forecast Lab as we're seriously behind schedule. It's going to be 8 o'clock p.m. here Central Time shortly, so it has taken a while to put this program together. I did want to mention these new temperature charts, highs and lows. We're going to be bringing these in to help round out the program. And for our supporters, we'll put your town on there. Now, you can't be near a major city that's already on here. We can't put Henderson for Las Vegas or Anaheim for Los Angeles, but if you're out at... Uh, O'Neill, Nebraska, or something like that, or Appleton, Wisconsin. I'll try to add you on there, so leave a comment or send me an email, and we'll get that put on in a smaller font. The bigger fonts will be for the cities. Also, Weather Map Handbook was officially released yesterday as an EPUB file. 
you can get it on Lulu at this address. There's the link for that. It is cheaper than the paper version since there's no shipping, there's no print costs or anything like that. So this is going to be the first officially supported ebook version of the forecast series. So you can get that now. This will eventually get filtered out to Kindle, Barnes & Noble and all that, but that will take weeks to months. And they take a larger cut of that. So if you want to support this program, get the Lulu version. All right. If this is a success over the coming months, we'll gradually move the other books out. Those take a lot of preparation effort because we have to reflow the layout. That's difficult to do for tables and illustrations. That will take some time, but we'll get that done as quickly as possible. And you can help support the program on Patreon as well. There is the link for that. All right, I need to get this wrapped up and get it posted. So I hope you have a great middle of your week. And we'll see you back here on Friday. Bye-bye.